The following is a reading from James Fraser's Treatise on Sanctification. Fraser lived from 1700 to 1769. We have something here in Romans 7, 14 to 25 that may be exceedingly useful to support and encourage those who go heavily under the evil of their hearts. It wouldn't be right to suggest anything that would tend to exclude the contrition for sin that ought to be in the heart of every child of God. Yet from the light and sensibility that is in every sanctified heart with regard to sin, the consequence might be extremely hurtful to the comfort and stability of a Christian if the Word of God has not provided something encouraging respecting his case, as there is in this context. So, if there are those who may abuse this passage, as they do also the other scriptures to their own destruction, serious Christians find cause to bless God for having provided for their comfort and for their direction in faith and duty by this very valuable portion of the Bible. I only add concerning this point the following words of Augustine, quote, He has set before you his own conflict, that you might not fear yours. For if the blessed apostle had not thus spoken, when you should observe the moving of lust in your members, to which you did not yield your consent, yet finding it to move, you would perhaps despair of yourself and say, If I belong to God, there would be no such motions in me. Observe the apostle in conflict, and don't despair." In quote. I add an observation and inference respecting the doctrinal subject. We have here occasion to observe the sad corruption which human nature has undergone, how deep the root of sin has gone in the hearts of men, and how great its force and activity is in the best of men. We have seen in the context preceding verse 14 the case of a person unregenerate with respect to this. He is under the law. And when the commandment comes, as verse 9, with its light, authority, and force into the conscience, it may be supposed to awaken him to great carefulness about curbing, subduing, or restraining the motions of sin in his heart. It might be thought that the authority and light of the law and the conscience, with the impression of the terrible threatening, might give great excitement to this and help a man much to it. Yet we have seen how little the law could do in this way. So far was it from subduing sin and the motions of it in the heart that sin did but move the more vehemently and show the more its great wickedness and force. In this latter context from verse 14, we have the case of a man under grace who had with great sense and experience the love of God, his heart commonly full of consolation by the assured prospect of eternal happiness and glory whose heart was greatly raised above things earthly and temporary, in full desire and pursuit of the things that are above, whose soul was animated with the warmest zeal for God and for holiness, and who had made great advances in holiness, inferior to no mere man we know of. Yet what heavy and sore complaint does he make of sin in dwelling in him? He did by its force what he allowed not, and what he seriously would, he could not perform. Though he delighted in the law of God according to the inward man, yet he found a law in his members warring against the law of his mind, and working hard to bring him into captivity to the law of sin, so that he cries out, Wretched man that I am! Shall we now say that the greatest advantage and strength which sin has in the heart of any man is only by deep-rooted habits, contracted merely by frequent acts, and a continued custom of sinning proceeding only from the unhappy use that each man makes of his free will, who has come into the world with his nature in the same original purity with which man was at first created, or if we rise not so high with no more deprivation than a man can get the better of by his own efforts and exertion of his moral powers, we have here before us what does not allow us to think so. If man's nature itself were not depraved and corrupted to a high degree, 
if human nature retained its full liberty and moral powers, without any greater disadvantage than acquired habits could have brought upon them. What mere habits could be so strong but they might be fully overcome by the most serious and earnest endeavors of a man under the sharp discipline of the law in his conscience? But if in the state and way a man could not do it, might we not suppose that a man made free from the dominion of sin by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost and brought under grace, which is that in it that tends to engage a man most effectually to holiness, would he be able, by his most sincere and powerful endeavors, an earnest exertion of all his moral powers, with the assistance of the Holy Spirit dwelling in him, to overcome any small remaining degree of natural deprivation and every evil habit, in a most effectual and complete manner, so that there should not be the least remainder of any evil habit, or have sent it all in him? But which of the saints is it whose experience has testified any such thing? There is none of them in whose experience we might more readily expect to find it than this eminent apostle, considering his attainment in grace, light, and holiness. Yet how far from this is the case here represented? In a person's most eminent for holiness, of whom we have the history at any length in the scripture, this evil fountain has discovered itself by the streams it has sent forth. If this blessed apostle was preserved from remarkable lapses in outward practice, yet here where he lays open his heart he shows a source of sin yet remaining within him, by which he had manner of constant exercise of struggle and of godly sorrow, and what from his own experience afforded good reason for giving the salutary advice to every other Christian. You stand by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. The scripture acquaints us that there is not a just man that does good and sins not. We have here what accounts for it and shows it shall ever be so, while Christians are in this life. This is that original sin which everyone has derived from a corrupt original, and which is itself the original and source of all a man's moral deficiencies and actual transgressions in outward and inward practice and whose root is so deep in human nature as never to be wholly eradicated in this life. The power of divine grace and of the Holy Spirit could doubtless soon do it perfectly, if divine wisdom had not thought otherwise fit, and that Christians should labor under imperfection, and having the remainder of sin dwelling in them to struggle with, that with minds well enlightened and hearts truly sanctified they might, from what they constantly feel, perceive sensibly and understand thoroughly the wretched state from which divine grace saves them, might be kept from trusting in themselves, and might ever hold all their consolation and hope of the rich and the free grace of God in Jesus Christ through faith. It is a matter of very serious consideration to observe that to what high attainments eminent saints have discovered much of sin remaining in them. Moses was at two different times, forty days and forty nights in the mount with God, and God had often spoken to him face to face, as a man does to his friend. Yet it was after this that an unholy passion in him made its eruption in a manner very provoking to God. David was under great influence of grace in his ordinary course and behavior, and was often under divine inspiration, yet thereafter it appeared in fearful instances that the root of sin still remained in him, so as to give him occasion to look back to his original deprivation, and to say in Psalm 51, 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. The sinful failures of prophets might be here mentioned. For one example, Jonah had received frequent revelations from God, yet after this, how great proof did he give of sinful mistrust and fear, of remaining rebelliousness against the government of the Almighty, even after being delivered out of the well's belly, and of turbulent and violent passion, as is narrated in the short history that bears his name. Paul, a New Testament saint, made great advances in light and holiness. He labored hard against sin within. He kept under his body. He had great helps to the mortifying of sin, even in the various outward trials and distresses that he was very commonly exercised with. 
With all this, he had abundance of revelations and was even wrapped up into the third heavens some years before he wrote to the Romans. But after being in heaven, he needed the acutely painful thorn in the flesh to keep the evil root that yet remained in him from springing, unless he should be exalted above measure. Even lest, so he emphatically repeats it, he should be exalted above measure. In our context, how sad the representation he gives us sin dwelling in him. Ah, oh, how deep has sin gone in human nature. Christians have the use to make of the case here set before them that Paul himself made of it, who not only at his first conversion but ever after had it greatly at heart to be found in Christ, not having his own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is by the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Christians will, whilst in this life, carry about with them what may give them a sensible proof and deep impression of the obligation they are under to the free grace of God. What great power of grace it requires to present them at last a church glorious and without spot. And what is the exceeding riches of God's grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus? Enough seems to have been said to vindicate the true sense of this context and some of the practical uses in which have been marked out. But I observe that the man who speaks here is one who delighted in the law of God and in its holiness in the inner man who willed, loved, and endeavored what was good and right, who hated sin and was conflicting against it, crying out sorrowfully of his wretchedness by it, and who himself with his mind served the law of God, I cannot help considering it as one of the phenomena in the learned world the most difficult to account for, that any men of learning and judgment could interpret these things of persons unregenerate, under the law, destitute of the Holy Spirit, Yea, of persons who have abandoned themselves to wickedness as Ahab and the revolters from the true religion before mentioned, let the reader judge for himself. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Paraphrase. We know that the law of God is spiritual, that its authority and demand reaches to a man's spirit and heart to prescribe rules to it and to every inward motion of the soul. And it is by its being thus spiritual that I heretofore received the thorough conviction of my sinfulness. When upon this extensive view of the law, I do now compare myself with it and consider the perfect inward as well as outward purity it requires. How little I am conformed to its holiness. How great a disconformity to its holiness does still remain within me. I do not only refer to the time when I was in my natural condition in the flesh, when that evil principle was absolutely dominant in me, being under the law and its curse, destitute of the spirit, when sin had its full course in me in one form or other, but even at this time being under grace, thereby delivered from the law, and made free from the dominion of sin, even yet, alas, though I am now in a comfortable state, how far from that holiness of heart which the spiritual law requires am I? I am carnal, the flesh, that corrupt source and principle of evil, though deprived of its dominion, yet still is what indeed I do not favor or love. For of what my will inclines to by its habitual determination, that, obstructed by the flesh and the weakness which remaining corruption brings upon me, I do not. But what I truly and sincerely hate, that, through its influence, I too often do. Text 16. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Paraphrase. If then, what my heart works and does within me by means of the evil that springs up from the flesh and corrupt nature, contrary to the holy and spiritual law, is indeed what is contrary to the fixed and in habitual inclination of my will, then I do not only by my understanding or mind assent to it as a truth that the law is good, but this habitual inclination of my will shows that I heartily consent to the goodness of the law, that it is good in itself, as I said. Verse 17, Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now then, though strictly speaking, it is I who do all that is done by the activity of sin in my heart. 
and so I cannot justify myself before this holy and spiritual law, nor say I am not chargeable with it, yet grace under which I am, and which his special and tender regard to the sincerity of the heart and will, allows me to take some comfort with respect to the sad case, by distinguishing and saying, It is not I myself who do the evil which I sincerely hate, and is so contrary to the habitual inclination of my will, but my most hateful enemy sin, which continues its habitation, though not its dominion in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Paraphrase. It is grace that allows me thus to distinguish, yea, the real distinction that is in me is of grace the honor of which it is to be ascribed to its blessed author. For as to me otherwise, as I am by nature, and so far as my nature is yet unrenewed in me, that is, in my flesh, which is what I naturally, in abstracting from grace, I call my own and myself, I know that no good thing dwells. For though, through grace, there is a readiness in me to will that which is good, Yet through the obstruction which the flesh gives, I find not myself able to perform in the constant, thorough, and perfect manner, which I will, and which the holy law requires. Verse 19. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Paraphrase. For the whole good that my will is fully bent on and inclined to, I don't do. But sin ever springing up in me, through remaining corruption is what on the part of the flesh I do, and that against the fixed determination of my will. Verse 20. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Paraphrase. Now as a man's moral character is to be taken from the sincere habitual inclination of his heart and will, if by the influence of the flesh I do what is contrary to the spiritual and holy law, and what my will is averse to, it is not I. Let me again encourage myself somewhat with the thought. It is not my very self that does it, but sin that dwells in me. Verse 21. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Paraphrase. I find then a law, not such as has a true light and just authority, but a principle strong and effective, that when my will is well determined to that which is good, evil even the unholy motions that are spontaneous and corrupt nature takes a start of my better will and prevents its effect, so that I cannot do what I would in the inward and outward practice of holiness. Verse 22 For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Paraphrase As I have been saying, that now when I am under grace, my will by its habitual inclination is really on the side of holiness. The truth of the matter is that I sincerely delight in the law of God, and in the holiness which it recommends and requires according to my inward man, that new man in me, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Verse 23, But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Paraphrase. But though by this delight in the holiness of the law my heart has got an habitual and prevailing determination to holiness, yet I find a law in my members which has in some degree taken possession of all my faculties, giving false light and prejudice to my mind and judgment a corrupt bias off into my will, putting my affections and passions in irregular and impetuous motion, and so warring against the law of my mind, that good principle and law which God, according to the promise of the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 33, Hebrews 8, 10, has put in my mind and written in my heart, so warring against my soul, 1 Peter 2, 11, and laboring hard, and with too much success in some particular instances, to captivate me to the law of sin which is in my members. Verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Paraphrase. What a miserable condition this. To be free of this, I would count myself happy in all such various perils, as I have gone through such multiplied tribulations as I have undergone. Those have not made me miserable, 
but this worst of enemies within myself, by means of this, ah, what a wretched man am I, who shall deliver me from this body of death from which it has hitherto exceeded all my powers of nature or grace to rescue me? Verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Paraphrase. I thank God, who has provided comfort for me with respect to this my present wretchedness, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by virtue of whose cross the old man in me is crucified, which gives me the sure and delightful prospect that this body of sin and death shall in due time be absolutely destroyed, and I completely and forever delivered from it. So then, the conclusion of the whole is, with my mind, that good and most prevailing law which divine grace has put in my mind and heart, I my very self do, if imperfectly yet, truly and sincerely, serve the law of God, though alas with the flesh, the cause of my greatest sorrow, the law of sin. This has been a reading of James Fraser's book on sanctification. www.puritanaudiobooks.net